thing, First. one thing that's very, very important is that, Daniel, you mentioned about uh, Jabotinsky. And that is, as if to say, uh, Moshe is against the Zev Jabotinsky. It's very funny because the current, uh, the current chairman of Likud, who advocates a Palestinian state, and I believe him, I believe he wants a Palestinian state in this country. I have learned to believe my political leaders. When Ariel Sharon said he was going to remove every single Jew from Gush Katif, we all said, ah, he doesn't mean it, he's just saying it, because this way he could cut a deal. We all found he was telling the truth. I believe Netanyahu is looking to create a Palestinian state. And you mean to tell me that that is what Jabotinsky wanted? Jabotinsky dreamed of Shtei Gadot Leyardain. He wrote that song, Shtei Gadot Leyardain. Moshe Feiglin believes in Shtei Gadot Leyardain. And uh, so therefore, we're definitely more in line with the Jabotinsky Begin dream than Netanyahu will ever be. That's first of all. <laughs> Judaism is also important to, to, to Jabotinsky because again, Likud is... And I really do feel at home in Likud. Likud is a microcosm of Israeli society. You go to a Likud meeting and you see Am Yisrael at this meeting. You see Haredim and you see Ashkenazim and Sephardim and Datilu Mi and Chiloni. You see everybody there. It is an incredible thing. As part of an official Likud conference, there'll be times for Mincha, there'll be times for Marav. We don't have to beg to Davin Marav. It's on the program. It's part of the, uh, it's part of the evening. Nobody forces anybody to Davin, whoever wants to. Yes, no. Likud is Am Yisrael, and that's where we have to go and make it a strong place. The, the key point that I just want to make is, 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 is this, and that is, let's not forget, this is our chance to not just send a message, but to really make a clear statement. Likud, if you want to stick to the charter of Likud, it's not a constitution, but it's called Matzah Likud, the charter of Likud, is opposed to a Palestinian state, wants judicial reform, and should have a defense minister from inside Likud, then you had better not vote for Bibi Netanyahu next week. And to put a petak lavan, or to stay home, is to is to just erase the one chance of democracy that you really have. I urge each and every one of you, vote for Moshe next Tuesday. Okay, so what I'd like to do, is starting with Emmanuel, deal with some ideological issues that haven't been brought up. Sidhu <laughs> <laughs> Rock is not very good, but from the guys what? Sidhu wasn't born when he was elected. <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone who was young at the time, actually. Uh, his name is Danny Navet. Danny Navet is the head of the Likud ideological body, which is called the Likud Lishka. And it has not met since he retired from politics about six years ago now. This election is supposed to be about ideology and not only about politics. So starting with Emmanuel, I want you to talk about ideology beyond uh, matters of uh, war and peace. Because I believe that on those issues, the three of you agree, and that's boring. <laughs> What's that, Arya? We'll He's the Balabayat, one second, oh, before yeah. Manuel answers. How was the Lishka uh, elected? Asked, what's going to happen is after this election, uh, you're electing not a central committee, technically, you're electing a Veida, which uh, means convention, literally in English, I don't like that word, so I try to avoid using it. Um, and it will be a Veida. Until it, is, until it votes itself into a central committee. While it is a veida, it is much easier to change the Likud's laws. And while it's a veida also, they will be electing a head of the secretariat, and a head of the lishka, um, and a head of, the, of themselves, of the, of the veida, and a head of the central committee. Um, and so uh, we don't know yet who is running for a head of the uh, lishka. First of all, regarding Danny Nave, I, I did not know that he was still in charge of the ideology of Likud, which is really interesting since he left politics many years ago. So regarding ideology, uh, first of all, I don't think that uh, Netanyahu actually wants a, uh, a Palestinian state. I mean, I don't know him personally, but I think that when he, uh, when he uh, gave his speech in Barilan, uh, he was giving it under the pressure of the, uh, of the Barak administration 
I, I don't think that he, uh, he actually wants a, a Palestinian state, but it brings me to the issue of ideology. Uh, again, I, I, uh, I, I have much respect for Moshe Figli. I just don't think that uh, today he's fit to be prime minister. I mean, I, I like him, but I don't think he's, uh, he's fit for the job. You know, I love my wife very much, but I don't want her as my prime minister. It's all I need. You know, that, that it's, it's nothing personal. It's all a question of being qualified for the job. Uh, but uh, he has, to his credit, he has the merit of bringing issues about ideology uh, uh, in Israel. When many people have stopped talking about ideology and only talk about uh, politics, and he does talk about policies, and he does bring up many issues, and uh, I must say to his credit, uh, doesn't mean I always agree with him, but I do think that one of the problems of the right uh, since the Oslo Agreements is that the right has been correct about the failures of the, uh, of the Oslo process. But when you look at it, it is pretty amazing that this process and the whole logic of Oslo keeps failing. And the more, you know, the more you have governments in Israel who are trying to promote some kind of peace agreements with the Palestinians based on the same ideology, uh, ideology of Oslo, we get more terrorist attacks and we get more... And, and beyond the ideology, the, 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 the diplomatic issue? Because I think that the right, the, the reason why, despite the fact that this, this process is a failure, and more and more people in Israel today identify with it, it's pretty amazing. It's like a, a, a company that loses money and whose uh, uh, shares on the stock market keep going up. Because when... 30 years ago, when you said you were in favor of a Palestinian state in Israel, you were considered an extremist. Today, if you say you're against it, you're considered an extremist. And I think the right is partly responsible for it because it hasn't really provided uh, an alternative to Oslo. Just say, we, we're against it, it's not working. That's true, but what do you propose? That's one thing. That's regarding the conflict. <clears throat> I think that um, the right also has, and the Likud needs to really provide a, an alternative in terms of ideology about the, uh, the place of Judaism, we're just talking about it, in Israeli society, uh, the relationship between the state and, and Judaism, and of course, uh, the division of power. How do we want to, the Jewish state to be built? The fact that we do not have a constitution, the fact that the voting system in Israel was inherited from the time of the Yeshuv, and this voting system is not working because uh, we do not have this district elections, the question of... Uh, um, the question of uh, the Supreme Court, uh, the fact that you have some people in Likud today whose only ideology when it comes to the Supreme Court is to say, well, Menachem Begin said once there are judges in Israel, so we have to stick to this. But what is the ideology regarding the division of powers in Israel? The fact that all the uh, cabinet members are also members of Knesset. So uh, I think that we, as you said, we have to think about ideology b beyond the conflict and focus on the question of the place of Judaism in Israeli society and of uh, constitutional reform and electoral reform. Ideology. Well, first of all, does Bibi want a Palestinian state? I don't believe that he wants a Palestinian state. I think if you read, if, you, if, we, if we want to say, well, listen to our leaders, what, what are they actually saying, and we should believe them, if you read the, the Bar Ilan speech, it didn't say, I want a Palestinian state. He said, we're willing to agree to this on these conditions. I don't, I don't think that those conditions are appropriate. There is no such thing as a demilitarized state. There have been demilitarized states. They either were, you know, went the way of the dodo or they became militarized. Uh, Nazi Germany was a demilitarized state. Uh, after World War II, Germany was again a demilitarized state. And now it has a military. Japan has a military. The Palestinians have a military. They have 40,000 uh, policemen who are under the, uh, the command of not a, uh, a police commander, but a, uh, a general. Uh, there's no such thing as a demilitarized state, so that is wrong. But I don't think Netanyahu wants a Palestinian state. He did come under tremendous uh, pressure from the uh, Obama administration. There's no denying that. And I think that, you know, to compare the current government and its stance on Yishuvim, Whatever, oh, there's this, this was bad and that was bad, and, he's, and, he, and he said the term Palestinian state or two states for two peoples, those are, those are bad things. But you can't compare the current government to the last one or to the one before that. In the last few governments, we had a prime minister who endorsed a roadmap, carried out the disengagement, the next one tried to do convergence, and, and then he tried to, uh, make a, try to give Abbas basically everything he could ever dream of. That's not happening in this government. So we can't, I mean, there is a difference here, and people should recognize that difference. I understand that there are problems and there's frustrations, but recognize that there's a difference. 
you know, give credit where credit's due. And beyond the diplomatic issue? Well, let's see. We talked about ideology. First of all, I'm very glad that the ideology committee has not met in a long time. I know generally it's not good when bodies don't meet, but the, in the chukah of Likud, I believe it is called a chukah, there is a section on what the party stands for. I actually have a copy of it here. I can give it to you afterwards. But it, it does say, it basically, not in the exact, it says that the goal of Likud is to extend national sovereignty to all parts of the homeland. It has things about social justice. It has things about individual rights. I don't want that changed. That is a pretty good ideology. I think Shmuel agreed with that. I don't want that change, so I hope that, that we don't get some, ha some kind of new active person who wants to change the ideology, because I don't, I don't think that it would go in a, in a good direction. But uh, a word on ideology. Uh, one of the main tenets of the Jabotinsky philosophy, Jabotinsky wrote this at the end of Shir Beitar, Sheket hu refesh efger dam v'nefesh. Uh, silence is despicable, leads to a loss of blood and, and soul, or blood of, and life. Um, democracy in the, in the pure sense, is about, is about ideas being express, expressed. When people go to the booth, they're voting for people who've talked to them about their ideas. And Israel democracy doesn't have a lot of that, unfortunately. Uh, Winston Churchill said that except for all the others, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. But in Israel, we probably have the worst form of democracy. Everything is backroom deals, and it's terrible. It's terrible. It's, I think it's the reason why people feel so like whatever you vote for, you're getting Shimon Perez. Uh, last point on what is our positive uh, response to the two-state solution? I think Menachem Begin actually put forward an autonomy plan. Uh, the Likud believes in a one-state solution with an autonomy plan. I mean, you could have variations of it, but in some kind of autonomy plan where the people, uh, the local inhabitants who are, not Jewish, who are not Jewish, who are not citizens of Israel, they will have all the uh, democratic rights except for basically full statehood with the military. That, I mean, Begin put that forward. I think it's something that we should think about uh, and we should be putting forward. We should be putting forward that as an alternative. Um, and the other alternative that should be included in that is Aliyah. Aliyah is an answer to our demographic problems instead of people uh, complaining, oh, we should just give away these territories and we'll lose our demographic problems. We have to be promoting Aliyah. And, I mean, I'm proud to say that Likud Anglos, this is one of the things that we focus on positively. It's not just about elections for us. We do lobby on the side. And I think that that has to be part of, it's actually in the Likud Constitution. It says uh, the ingathering of the exiles is part of, uh, is one of the goals that Likud strives to achieve. It's in actually the first line of the, uh, the, the definition of Likud. And that's also an alternative that has to be brought up. And, and as Anglos, we have to keep pushing for that. Do you know why Moshe Feiglin will never set up a Palestinian state? Because Moshe Feiglin believes that there's no such thing as a Palestinian, period. And <laughs> listen to my words very carefully. You can vote for Moshe, you cannot vote for Moshe. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, this is what's important. If you believe that there's such a thing as a Palestinian people, in the end, you will set up a Palestinian state. Nikuda Sof Pasuk, whether it's demilitarized, whether it's this ridiculous notion of autonomy, which doesn't work. If you believe that there's a Palestinian people, if you believe there's something called a Palestinian, in the end you will give them a state. So you need, we need a leader that simply does not believe that. As far as ideology is concerned, that's what Moshe is all about. That's what Mani Gut Yudit is all about. Because we have a decision we have to make here. Are we America's 51st state? Are we a Hebrew-speaking Singapore? Or are we a proud, strong Jewish state where every single child in this country deserves a Jewish education without religious coercion, without uh, being arm-twisted, but to understand where he or she came from? Some of the things that Moshe is trying to, to, to pass through the Knesset, for example, would be as follows. We want... Shabbos observance in this country to increase. But we all know that if we stop the soccer games on Shabbat, we just say, no soccer games on Shabbat, it's Chilul Shabbat. That will lead to blood because you can create a Palestinian state to give away Hebron. If you take away a guy's soccer game, he'll kill you. And what we want to do is have Sunday as a day off. But when we have that day off, we're going to then move the soccer games that are currently on Shabbat to Sunday. Now, I have spoken, personally, I've spoken to 100 non-from Jews in this country. It's called Chilonim. 
And I've asked them, let me ask you a question. This is this not a scientific poll in any way, but I've speaking, spoken to many, many people, over 100. And I've asked them, listen, pal, if you're off on Sunday and the soccer game is moved from Shabbos to Sunday, does that bother you? Is that okay with you? Again, provided you're off on Sunday. Never once did I get the following response. My grandfather went to soccer games on Shabbat. My father went to soccer games on Shabbat. I will go to soccer games only on Shabbat. I've never received that answer even once. They will gladly do it. And then a few things happen. Not only do we have Shmirat Shabbat with a smile, without twisting anybody's arms, but we can go to the soccer games with them. And this is something that, you, that is lacking in this country, so lacking, us versus them, religious, secular. There's another thing that Moshe calls for. Everybody says, oh, Haredi, no serve in the army, and the whole army issue. Moshe calls for a 100% volunteer army. 100% volunteer army. You don't want to serve in the army? Stay home. Go to university, do what you want. There's more than enough chayalim out there who want to serve, who understand the true meaning of, of a Jewish army since the, uh, that we haven't had for 2,000 years, the great zechut of being in a Jewish army, and we want those So These are the type of things <coughs> that we could end this sinatachim. We could end this baseless hatred that we have and we could figure out ways to do it. And we need a new approach. So yes, Moshe doesn't have experience. You're right. He has no experience in giving away land. He has no experience in sending 16 families into the cold, as Netanyahu has done in the last two weeks. He has no experience in, in, in appointing Ehud Barak as the defense minister. He has no experience in these type of things. And you know what I say to that? Baruch Hashem. is it what the found what the founder said so many years ago you have to really look I would think don't you have to look at uh, what they're saying today and you also when you're speaking by Netanyahu you, you were saying whatever whoever you vote for you get Shimon Paris and you were talking about how he was so pressured by the Obama administration does that bother you that the, you need a strong leadership does it bother you that he actually does fall under the pressure and you seem to be getting Shimon Harris, no matter who you vote for. Uh, what does that say about his leadership? And last, I want to ask you actually, and Emmanuel, um, you were um, talking about, you were, you were saying that you don't believe that Bibi wants a Palestinian state. Why don't you believe it? Um, because he keeps saying that he does want it. So what's the reason behind uh, it? First of all, there are a lot of ways that he, that he I think, un does uh, represent the um, Jabotinsky and Begin ideology. I mean, for instance, in the field of the economy, he does. We had these uh, tent city protests, and he basically said, "Yes, we need to correct the social problems uh, and the, the social injustices, as you might call them, but we also have to do so with a free economy." And that basically was Jabotinsky's philosophy. One of Netanyahu's strongest suits is is the economy. The average salary has been on the rise since he's been in office. Um, uh, they, one of the reforms that he passed was to uh, make these committees to build more housing. Um, when he was finance minister, he initiated a, a program of uh, matching funds for, uh, for high-tech funds. I mean, there, there, I think on, this is one area we could say, where we could say he's actually doing a very good job, and credit should be given where credit is due. Um, in regards to the uh, territorial issues, uh, I, I think that Bailan was a deviation from the Jabotinsky ideology. Uh, whatever mitigating fact, I think that you can, you know, in judging a person, uh, you, you do have to take into account mitigating factors, but it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. It was against Jabotinsky ideology and Begin ideology. In regards to uh, the way he's reacted to the Obama administration, again, I, I disagree with that. I disagree with the bar Ilan speech, but all I was saying was that this is a mitigating factor. He, uh, this is not, he didn't get the opportunity, let's say, to be in the White House when George Bush was president, uh, like Ehud Omer did. I, I believe that uh, he, he has done an amazing job at maneuvering. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree with the cost, with the, it being the cost being the bar line speech. So I, I don't agree with that. But, you know, he has outmaneuvered Obama. This is the most anti-Israel president. And I don't think you can, in regards to what you were asking Emmanuel, you can't say, you know, we had prime ministers who wanted to strike a deal. 
I think Omer wanted to strike a deal. Barak, when he was prime minister, wanted to strike a deal. They were offering anything. And Netanyahu is not offering anything. In fact, you could say the opposite, and this is, I'm sure, a lot of his leftist critics say, he, he is putting demands on negotiations, for instance, uh, demanding that they recognize that we are uh, a Jewish, that, that we have a right to exist as a Jewish state. That is something that the Palestinians are not able to do. And the government has rightly realized that that is a place where we can, we can rightly say, listen, we're not going to negotiate or we don't have to give away anything if they're not going to recognize this basic fact of, of life, that we're a Jewish state and we have a right to, to uh, be that way. So they're finding ways to, uh, to, uh, to deal with the administration and not give away land. And I think that's quite the opposite of an administration, of a government that wants to give, uh, give things away. Because it's very easy to give things away. You could do that unilaterally. We had a government that did that. They could be proposing plans on their own without any pressure, and they're not doing that. And that's what we saw other governments who really did want to give away land did. So I don't think he wants to give away land. I don't think, he, you know, I don't think that's a fair uh, characteriza characterization. He has said the term two states for two peoples. He has used that. He has uttered that term uh, several times. Not many times, but he has said it several times, and that's not good. But let's not, you know, pretend that he's like running after uh, Abbas to, uh, to make a deal. <laughs> in uh, the um, recognizing Israel as, as a Jewish state is indeed a precondition for uh, concessions, but not for negotiations. Why do I think that he doesn't actually uh, want a uh, Palestinian state? <clears throat> I, I don't know him personally, but um, he did repeat also, it's true, in his uh, UN speech in uh, September, uh, that he accepted the uh, the principle of two states for two, two peoples, and I uh, I'm also against uh, Barron's speech. And when a couple of weeks ago, uh, Newt Gingrich, who uh, is running for the primaries for the Republican Party in America, said that uh, there was no Palestinian people. Of course, uh, he said the truth. But the problem today, uh, when you say the truth, is that uh, people go berserk. I mean, if you just want to know where the truth is. Just look how crazy people go when you say something, and then it's a sign that you're saying the truth. So when everybody's getting, going crazy at you, who's getting mad at you, it's a good sign that you're saying the truth. And I wrote an article after that, uh, actually in the Jerusalem Post, uh, saying that historically, factually, of course there's no Palestinian people. And of course the Arabs are using this uh, as a strategy to establish a state in uh, Yehuda Shomron in line with the strategy of the PLO since 1974, which is the phase strategy, which consists of establishing a Palestinian authority and then a Palestinian state to destroy Israel from the inside. And they say it themselves. They say it. They're very clear about it. They say, of course, Faisal Husseini said in 2001, Oslo was the strategy of the Trojan horse. Uh, and I think that uh, the prime minister is, is aware of it. Now, the question is, so why did he say uh, he agreed on the principle of Palestinian state? Well, first of all, I think that when you listen to the Barilan speech and also to his, uh, then his speech at the, uh, the U.S. Congress and the, at the U.N., is that saying that you, you're, you agree on the principle of a Palestinian state as long as it, is, it is, as it is demilitarized and it recognizes Israel as a Jewish state is saying one thing and the opposite, because it's an oxymoron. No Arab leader, so-called Palestinian leader, will ever recognize Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people. Never. It will never happen. And of course, saying that it will be demilitarized doesn't even pass the, uh, the laughing test. I mean, uh, is Gaza demilitarized? Is Yudav uh, Shomron demilitarized? It's a joke. The first thing Arafat did when he crossed the, uh, uh, the uh, crossing point in Gaza was to bring weapons in his car, of course, uh, as a violation of the Oslo agreements. This will never happen. I think that, again, knowing Netanyahu's entourage, his father and his family, I think that it is in his DNA to be against a, a Palestinian state. Again, he, he said he, was, uh, he agreed to the principle, but again, based on conditions that um, uh, the Palestinians, the Arabs, will never, will never accept. So it, it is my gut feeling that he doesn't really want it, that he's just saying it for tactical reasons. I might be wrong, but that's uh, my feeling. So I was wondering if each of you, if like all three of you, can cite one verse, one on, uh, one on uh, Pasuk, which you look to for a source of like pride, for a source of what you believe in. And I'd be interested in like hearing of what that verse might be. Okay. 
Astad, Umik Amcha Yisrael Goyachad Ba'aretz. This is what we say, the Gemara says, this is what's written in Hashem's Tefillin. Umik Amcha Yisrael Goyachad Ba'aretz. Who are you, Israel, one nation in the land? But this is a key pasuk because this is our job. We're Goyachad Ba'aretz. And what type of Goy will we be? Goy meaning, of course, nation. We could be a Goy like everybody else, or we could be a Goy Kadosh. And that is our goal. And uh, it's a wonderful question, by the way, and uh, that's the puzzle that I, I look for, for uh, to motivate myself and, uh, and everything that I do. I don't know if anybody has ever looked in the back of the art school sitter. There's a, a pasuk. There's a pasuk for everybody's name. You're familiar with that. Right. I, I unfortunately had the worst pasuk. Mine was Danyan Dina Amok Echad Shivtei Yisrael. So it's definitely not my favorite pasuk. I don't even know what, what it really means and how I can take that to uh, my life. But um, if I had to uh, pick pick one, um, when I was doing uh, Committee Lamansion, when I had organized that, um, one of the main things that people said was. You don't, you don't have a right to criticize the government from abroad. You don't have, uh, you know, if the government decides something, you, uh, you have to, we have to abide by it here in America, at the time I was in America, and you don't get to say anything. And there's a pasuk in the Navi, I, I believe it's, is it Yeshayahu? Somebody can correct me. He says, uh, it was not Yeshayahu. Uh, the man Sion lo the man Yushalayim lo eshtok. Is that correct? Uh, you can't be silent. And I urge people at home who are watching and they're thinking to themselves, well, I don't have a right to say anything and I don't have a right to get involved. You do, and, and not only that, you probably, you're probably the place where, the, the, you're probably the wellspring of where uh, Zionist ideology is going to come from for the next uh, 50 years. So I hope you, you watching at home will uh, voice your opinions and come here and be a part of the process. So I will quote the most uh, controversial and political pasuk of the Bible in, my, in the best of my knowledge, which is from Kohelet. Uh, the heart of the smart man is on the right and of the idiot on the left. <laughs> that the existing members of Likud have to see that the, that the Likud members are moving more to the right. That will affect their votes in the coming months. That will affect how they think and the various bills that they present, what they vote, both sides of the coin. And that's important both on the central committee, the Moetzet Sniff, the head of, of, of the party. That sends a message to Gidon Sai, Yisrael Kaz, Yuli Edelstein, all of them. Very important that we do the right thing next week. <laughs>